Welcome to Deal Talk. I'm Jeffrey Vite. Let's talk about avoiding dealer tricks and buying smart when you purchase a, or lease a car, truck, motorcycle, boat, motorhome, any of that stuff. That discussion in turn will save some money and sometimes a lot of money. So let's keep talking about it. I was listening to a geopolitical strategist talk this week. His name is Peter Zehan. Smart guy. Whether you agree with him or not, you can tell he's smart as not. No question about it. This man advises many politicians and groups. He's worked for the government. He's an advisor. He's just a researcher that puts the two and two together, right? He agrees with me about EVs, which was kind of interesting that he did, and I expected he would if he was a true researcher. They are a ridiculous choice by the Green New Deal, according to him. They're ridiculous. They're dying out. And we'll go down, you know, go downhill faster as time goes on. They're not, and I know on the news it said this week that they're selling well in California. No, they're not. They're selling better than EV sell in other parts of the country, but they're not selling well. No. People aren't stupid. You know, it's beginning to become educated about it. It's just all, everything about them is bad. He named many of the points that I've mentioned, you know. But there's one that he talked about that I haven't stressed enough, that I brought it up before, I think, but never really stressed it. In order to build enough EVs for the future, for if they were going to work, if they were a reasonable answer to our problem, they would need a huge increase in nickel and chromium and lithium, all those metals. You'd have a tremendous increase in that, you know, three or four times, which has never happened in history, but that we've moved something up that much, but you'd have to move it up quite a chunk. In production. And most of the metal parts, you know, to the batteries would be affected by this. And like I said, three or four, they'd have to move it up by production up by three or four times. Where where, would that increase come from? (laughs) And what about the other sources competing for those materials? They're not the only ones, you know, electric vehicles aren't the only ones sourcing for those vehicles. In terms of importance, EV batteries would be way down on the list of other things that need those metals. And that, and the point of it is that electricity, think about this, electricity doesn't make anything. It just powers things. Fossil fuel makes a lot of things. They make plastic from it. They make other materials. About 90% of everything you touch every day is, comes from fossil fuel. But electricity, all it does is power. It doesn't build anything. But it's not turned into anything except electricity. So we start this week with the avoid all the bad EVs. (laughs) That's how we'll start this podcast for February here, 2023. Do not buy one unless you're getting it as a toy, you know, and you enjoy them for some reason. Okay, fine. If you can afford one, fine. If you think it makes a statement about your belief in in global warming, then buy one. But that's not going to make any difference in global warming. And that's a, you know, it's a, it's a pseudo belief. No question about it. It's not going to do it. It's got really has very little to do with it. Anyway, moving right along. That's our EV corner. It's just something to think about. Where are they going to get all this stuff to build the batteries? From the battery, you know, from the metal tree or something? It's just not going to work. And you can, you know, it's like we're headed towards the lighthouse here and or towards another ship and it turns out to be the lighthouse. You know, there's nothing you can do. You have to move off into something else. I did get a, a message this week, an email from a person. They said, Jeffrey, I love the podcast, and I used it four years ago when I purchased my truck, which is great. They, they know the podcast. My question is, has leasing straightened out and the resale concern handled, like you, the one that you talked about, which they must be, I'm sure this person was talking about resale. That's what it turned out to be. And is it the right thing to do? Still, leasing. Is it still a good alternative? Well, that's a really good question because the market has changed. It would make you think that everything's changed and really kind of everything has changed. And we're all affected by this crazy market, you know? And there's not much that I can do except for talk about it, right? And I covered it with this person. And I think they got the answers that they wanted. But it's definitely under the right circumstances. It's still the right way to go. Anyway, if you like the show, take a couple of minutes and do a review on whatever podcast source you use, whether it be iHeart or Apple or whatever one. 
please do a review. And if you've already done one, I really appreciate it. And there is a bunch of them on there, but I, I really need as many as I can get. Tell everybody you know about the podcast and save them money and possibly big money and you'll be a hero. You know that. I've heard about it. And in fact, I mentioned on last week's show that I'd heard about it before and I got somebody else this week that sent me an email about it and said, yeah, his sister. He had saved his sister a bunch of money by telling her about the podcast. And so that was, that was cool. Listeners who'd like some written material to carry when you're out shopping and get a copy of The Informed Buyer, we're well, starting to sell them. They've sold, we've sold thousands and nobody's complained. It's a very, very helpful item. You put it in your smartphone or in your tablet or whatever, and it's three bucks. I mean, think about how long can you run on for three bucks. It'll give you the basics for quick reference when you're in the buying process. And best of all, it's still three bucks. Right. Seven years later, it's still three bucks. Heck with inflation. Full speed ahead, right? <laughs> Whether leasing is good or not depends on the term and the transportation goals you have. There's, there's some other factors. I have leased new vehicles over the last 25 years. That's all I've done. I haven't bought any new vehicle. I've leased. I believe short-term leasing in the normal market is the best way to go on a new vehicle. No question about it. In this market, you need to find a vehicle offered at MSRP or less. Over MSRP amounts are usually required up front by the leasing company. A leasing company that's, you know, that's basing their lease payments on the fact that the vehicle has a certain amount of resale percentage and it starts out at a certain price with a certain payment. They're not going to go over the book price, the MSRP price, in their loan. So normally, I, I'm sure there is some that will, but most won't. And they're going to make you come up with that money as down payment. Well, that kind of defeats the whole purpose of leasing, right? I mean, let's face it. One of the best parts about leasing is you control your outgo. You just, all you pay is the payment. You just get to sign and drive and compare those numbers. And that's an easy thing to shop, easy for comparison. And you get to sign and drive and you make your monthly payments and that's it. You end up paying, you never end up paying all the sales tax. You end up paying for the vehicle. And if in the right market, in the right terms, you get the advantage if there's some extra resale left when you're done with it, you get the advantage of handling that too. Now, there's been a change there, and we'll talk about that. I get a lot of questions about leasing. Some are very basic and some are more in-depth. My episodes about leasing get the most downloads and most listeners, for, for just about for sure, that or electric vehicle episode. That one, I think, got the most, the record. Even middle-aged and older people don't seem to really understand leasing. All these years it's been going on and nobody really gets it. People are leery of leasing because of the bad press by others that just don't get it. There's a lot of people out there that think that say they do and they don't get it. Often it's because finance gurus say, don't lease. It's not a good investment. Like I said, they don't get it. They look at the dollars in a cut and dried way. Just this is the, what you spend, this is the cost difference. They don't look at all the other factors that you gained from leasing. They can't factor in the math so as to recognize all those advantages. Only a lineup, lineup of numbers. They don't think about things like driving a new car more often so it's safer. They don't talk about all that stuff and the possibility of a profit at the end and the guaranteed resale value, not having to worry about resale value. And, you know, all these other things, the, the fact that you don't have to buy all the amenities that many people do with a leased vehicle. You don't have to do the servicing on a leased vehicle. You know, because you only have it if you stick to the three-year program. There is no really lease, uh, servicing to do in that period of time that's needed. As long as I can remember the top business people worldwide, according to the things I've read, say to that you should buy things that appreciate, like land, and that you should lease things that depreciate so that you don't take a big hit on the investment. Pay for the part of those items that you use just like renting something, you know? It's the same idea. If I was just going to list out the straight advantages to leasing, I'd probably give you a list something like this. I'd say guaranteed resale value, you know, eliminating the risk of damage, you know, repainting, all those things that affect the value, you limit all, all that risk. If that happens, it's not your loss. You're able to get equity out if there is any, and that's gotten harder now because they've changed those rules. Hopefully, they're going to change them back. Four new vehicles. In a 10-year period, on a three-year lease, you end up getting four vehicles. 
in a, in a purchase, the most you're going to end up with is two with normal financing. Now, if you pay cash, whatever, you can afford it. But if you're financing and you were doing a, let's say you even did short-term new car financing and did it 60 months. I mean, people go 96 months, 84 months now, but let's say you kept it at 60. The most you could get would be one and a half. You're always in a fairly new vehicle. You never have to worry about the latest, you know, things that have come out. Three years old would be the oldest you'd have. Able to buy out for a known value. In other words, if you decide you want to keep the vehicle, you don't drive it many miles, you want to keep it, you know that price that you're going to have to pay. It's not like you have to go out and wheel and deal on a used vehicle. That was determined when you leased it. You never pay all the sales tax. You're only taxed on the monthly payment. So the tax that you'd have would not be the equivalent of if you'd bought it. You get additional legal support. I mean, you, you get in an accident, you're getting sued, you go in the courtroom. There's three guys in a pinstripe suit that walk in with you with briefcases, you know, at the same time. Those are the folks that are, belong to the leasing company because it was their vehicle. So they're trying to protect themselves, which, you know, runs over to you. you it's got to be helping to protect you if they're protecting themselves, and that's the leasing company, right? Better quality vehicle for a sim, you know, for a similar monthly payment. That's another advantage to leasing. A lot of times, we talked about this a lot in the luxury edition when we talked about luxury leasing in the podcast. You can get a vehicle that's much better quality for about the same payment if you lease compared to wanting to buy it and own it. Yeah, that's you know a little better vehicle for nearly the same payment, and you don't have the outlay or credit against your record. In other words, it doesn't show a gigantic loan. Leasing doesn't show up like loans. You get to pocket your trade-in value instead of using his down payment if you want. You go in to lease a vehicle, you lease it, you had a trade, you can just have him write you a check if you want and use that by his loan pool. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to trade your vehicle in. You could just get a check for it. That's another beauty of the leasing. Driving the latest technology sooner, we've talked about already. Easily no maintenance in a short-term lease. So if you do a 36-month lease and you're driving, let's say, 36,000 miles in that 36 months, you might have to change the oil once or twice. That's it. Nothing else. You don't even need tires in that period of time. Nothing. That's the kind of list that I would give for the advantages. And there's other advantages, but that's, that would be the quick list. It is a different way of thinking, and it carries with it some different thing, lingo. And if you're going to opt for leasing, you need to understand the lingo. The lingo is different for leasing. So when you go into wheel and deal... I think this is one of the reasons why people sometimes are scared of it because they don't understand the terms. To help you understand, I'm going to go over the terminology of leasing with some simple and clear definitions. No real order of the explanations other than as close to alphabetically as I can. <laughs> there have been a couple of changes recently we will cover. Some of the things they're going to bring up to you is things like acquisition fee. A bank also could be called a bank fee, initiation fee. Some leasing companies charge an acquisition fee, a fee for just doing the lease or for initiating the lease. It's charged by the lesser, and a lot of times they expect you to pay it aside from the lease payment. They would want it to be separate. You know, it can be called initiation fee. They can call it a lot of things bank fee. They start usually typically around 400 bucks, and they're seldom ever negotiable. But most factory leasing companies, you know, the that are backed by the manufacturer, don't charge an acquisition fee. Nope, they charge a turn-in fee a lot of times. We'll get to that. Adjusted capitalized cost, that's the final amount, the lease payments based on what they're calculated on. So if you came in to buy a vehicle and the capitalized cost would be the full price if you were doing a sign and drive. If you had a trade-in and the trade was worth 6000 it was a $32,000 vehicle, right? You'd have a 6 from 32 is 26 so you'd have a $26,000 adjusted capitalized cost. Now, the reason I know that is because they're going to be talking about capitalized costs sometimes, leasing companies, as opposed to selling price. Because they can't say you're buying it because you're not buying it. Actually, a leasing company buys it. You're leasing it. And that trade would be caused capitalized cost reduction. Capitalized cost reduction is another way of saying down payment. So if you had a trade worth 6000 that's a capitalized cost reduction or a down payment. Or unless you owed money on it. So if you had a $6,000 trade and you owed 5000 on it, you'd only have the difference between what you owed and what they gave you on a trade. That difference would be called capitalized cost reduction. A captive lease company is a lease company that's finance division is with the automaker. 
So with Honda, Honda Credit is a captive leasing company. Ford has one. Chevy has one. GM, GMAC. Mercedes-Benz has one. Almost every company in the country has its leasing company. And then there's some outside leasing companies that have theirs too, you know. And some of them are good and some not so good. So I always try to go with the manufacturer unless there's some other un- unusual thing going on. But if it's a new vehicle, you go with the manufacturer because nobody's going to think the residual value is more than the manufacturer. So you're not only going to get a high residual, and that's what affects the monthly payment. The higher the residual, the lower the monthly payment. Now, there's also different types of leases. Open-end lease, a lease that requires the consumer to pay the difference between the vehicle's residual value and the actual value. So those are called open-end leases. When you're responsible for the ending value, that's an open-end lease. Almost nobody takes an open-end lease anymore. Sometimes companies do because it lowers the payment, and they'll just buy their own vehicle. The write-off for corporations is a lot of times different for a lease. That's an expense like rent. It just comes off the top. Whereas if you have a vehicle and you own it, well, then you have to depreciate it over a certain period of time. And it's a little bit more involved, and I'm not sure what the tax advantage would be for each company to have their own. It depends on the company. So, But consumers generally never take an open-end lease. But 95% of leases in this country are closed-end lease, one type. That's 95% of the leases in America. At the end of the lease, you can buy it for the pre-described residual value, which most companies will tell you what that is up front. Not everybody. Some companies will say, well, that's up to us. Never mind the residual value. We're leasing you the vehicle. At the end of the lease, it's ours. If you want to buy it, you can negotiate terms at that point. You know, some people are okay with that because they're just going to lease. They don't want to buy it. There's no chance they're going to want to buy it at the end, and that's fine. If their payment's the best, that's fine. If you don't care. But me, I'd be, I'd be gone at that point. <laughs> they would have never got that all out of their mouth, and I'd be out of there. I'd be somewhere else. So the, the other advantage of the closed-end lease, if you have a, a value at the end, let's say it's worth, well, I'll give you an example. I just bought out my lease, what, a year ago? And the value at the end, they were going to give me $24,000 for it, a Toyota dealer, and the buyout was 18600 you think, well, geez, that's five thousand dollars you could have made. Yeah, it is. But what do I drive then? I got to buy something else in this stupid market. I just bought my own vehicle because I was buying it under wholesale, five thousand under wholesale, which is like seven or eight thousand under retail. That just made sense, and that's what I did. And that's a, a beauty of leasing. Close end lease is you make sure that you can buy it out at the end. You have to ask the company, can I buy it out at the end? And what would that value be? If you don't ask, they're not going to bring up that information. You got to ask them. Most companies say, yes, you can buy it at the end, and here's how much it is. And that residual value has to get disclosed to you at some point. Doesn't mean they don't have to sell it to you for the residual value. If they'll tell you that right up front, most will. Most. It's not going to be a problem. So closed-end lease, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the way you want to get one anyway. Open-end is something you just avoid. Don't ever go with an open-end lease unless you're a, you know, a company that's going to get an advantage of a write-off and you're going to buy it at the end anyway. In leasing, the lack of responsibility to the resale is probably why they're so popular in a lot of cases. The buying price is the lease contract. That's what the buying price is. So the leasing company that's buying this vehicle for you to lease it to you, you know, a lease contract for that fixed amount to purchase. And then they, in turn, have a contract with you to lease it. In some cases, the leasing company will negotiate to a lower price or if it was discussed in the beginning, they, you know, they could ask for more than the residual value. The buying price in the lease contract is supposed to be fixed. In some cases, the leasing company will negotiate to a lower price, maybe, if the market's flooded. You know, if they got a whole bunch of vehicles and they need to get rid of them, they might even sell the vehicle for less than the residual value. If it was not discussed in the beginning, they, they would ask for more than the residual value. So, That's what happens with that closed-end lease. They could ask for more if they wanted to. Most new vehicle manufacturers will not do that, but it it never hurts to make some conversation to at least ask. Because at the end of your lease, if they were crowded and they had a bunch of leases, a lot in that product, they had a bunch of, let's say you had a a model of Ford, they had hundreds of thousands of them coming back under lease or 100,000 coming back under lease, they might have a residual value of 15,000 and offered you for 14 just because they got so many to get rid of. They're you know, at the auction, they're afraid they're going to take a lick, and so they offered you for 1000 less. You know how you find that out? You ask, can I buy it for any less than the residual? 
If you can't, you can. It's not like they're cheating you. You know, that's like I couldn't buy mine for any less than the residual. I asked them. No, I was lucky to get it for the, you know, for the residual because the contract says they will sell it to me in residual. They wouldn't allow me to trade it in anywhere else, though. That was the problem. That's where it all started. They wouldn't allow me to trade it in if I wanted a Honda. No, that's that rule change that it went through a couple of years ago where I believe all the manufacturers colluded, and unfortunately our government hasn't done anything about it yet, but they should. They did collude to make it so that company, so that people that leased, after they've leased, and led to believe that they could trade it anywhere, they turned around and said, no, nah, no, nah, you can't. You can't trade it any place. You can only trade it with us. Or sell it outright if you want to yourself. You, we'll sell it outright to you, but you can't sell it outright. In other words, you couldn't get somebody to buy in the car and pass the title from the leasing company to them. You have to buy it. So your choices are to buy it or, or, you know, or turn it in. They made it very, very, very slim. It's very unfair pressure. And... I had the attorney general involved. I've talked to him. I talked to the attorney general from Florida. I talked to the attorney general office of the United States. They said they were working on it. They haven't done squat. They didn't do anything. They did absolutely nothing. Nope, they don't care. And it's unfortunate because that's as de deceptive as you can. Now, it'd be different if you started a lease and they told you right up front, look, at the end, we're not going to allow you to trade it in any place else. You can buy it at the end if you want or turn it in. That's your choice. As long as you know that going in, okay, well, I've decided to go with the lease and I understand that I can either buy it or turn it in. But in my case, and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, I'm sure, they weren't told that. They were told that they could trade it any place they wanted to, and then halfway through the lease, they changed the rule. That should be against the law. That's against truth and lending, but the truth and lending laws are different under certain regimes than they are or were currently under. And, you know, even if you looked at it, even if it wasn't in writing, the fact that we've been able to do it so, so many times for so many years, that lends to, that adds some authenticity to it. That, that alone will win in court. But can't get anybody in the General, Attorney General's office to do anything about it, unfortunately. They got bigger fish to fry, I guess. Then there's the single payment loose, lease, a.k.a. advanced payment lease. A lease in which the consumer can pay all of the lease fees and payments at the beginning. So if you had a 36-month lease, you pay all 36 months right up front, along with the down pay, any down payment if there's any. You pay for your whole, entire lease in advance. It's a newer type of lease. It's likely an option. You know, it's not an option for most people. Most people can't afford to pay for a lease or they wouldn't be leasing, right? They just buy a vehicle. But spendthrifts who are concerned about spending money and not being able to make monthly payments might choose that way, right? A likely user is an affluent buyer who could pay cash buy a car but wants to have a new vehicle every three years, so he just pays the monthly payments. And usually if you have an advanced payment lease, you've got a better interest rate. If you tell, for instance, Honda, okay, we'll pay the whole of the lease in advance, well, then the interest rate might go from 2% to 1%. Because they've got no, the only loan that they're making at that point is the residual value. Honda or whoever has still got their money tied up in the lease in the residual value of the vehicle, not in the payments. So the risk is less. But there's still some risk because it's the original value and they've still got the money tied up or that value tied up. And so they have to charge some interest. They just get you a break. But it's still, for some people, it works out. I've never done much of that when I was in the business. Not many people opted for that. But I've had one or two that did. The break in the interest and the fact that they had the money and they wanted, and a lot of times it's because they want a different write-off. Leasing is definitely a different write-off. They have the Consumer Leasing Act. It requires leasers to disclose all leasing costs, also known as the Regulation M. The Consumer Leasing Act took effect on January 1st, 1998, and they have to disclose to you all the facts of what the you were paying, what the, the lease is based on, the amount of money, and the residual value. They don't, like I said, and you have to ask them if they're going to sell it for residual value. Just because they disclose it doesn't mean they have to sell it unless you, they tell you they will. Then you've got a dealer prep fee, some dealers, a few may charge getting the car ready for purchase or lease. Some leasing companies have, right? But some manufacturers will, though. You know, the local Hyundai dealer might say, look, we're leasing it to you for this amount of money. We need $300 to prep the vehicle for that. And it's baloney. It's no different than getting ready for a sale. It's just another way for them to hawk some money off you, but that's what, it, what they do. They fill it up with gas and they wash the vehicle. You can, a lot of times you can negotiate that fee out. It's not like a dealer fee. You know, the dealer fee is still going to be in there. 
and the dealer and the leasing fee, if they have one, is still going to be in there. But this fee you can a lot of times negotiate out. It's a prep fee. Default charge is the penalty fee charged to the leasee for a late monthly payment. Most companies have a set amount. I think the most common amount I've seen is 25 bucks. If you're late, it's $25 extra. But it can be based on the interest. It can be based on whatever they want. But they'll tell you that up front. If you're going to have, think you're going to have late payments, you might want to know. Deficiency. The difference between the amount owed on a leased vehicle and its current cash value. So let's say that the lease has the residual plus 10 payments left. And the payments were 300, so 3,000 plus a residual of 15,000, so that would be $18,000. And if it's only worth 15,000, the deficiency would be 3,000. Now, if you have a serious accident early in a buy, such as the deficiency, if you had an accident at that point and you owned a vehicle, you'd eat that $3,000. That's how it goes. But gap insurance will make the difference up in a lease. All leases include gap insurance. Well, I should say all up until now, at least. It's a built-in gap so that if you have a wreck and you owe 20000 and the insurance company says that the book says you only have to pay eighteen, that 2000 is paid by the insurance company, the gap insurance company. You should not have to buy it extra on a lease. It should be included. You have to ask. Early termination. When the consumer adds the lease before the agreed upon time, if it's just paid off, there's no penalty. So if you go in and pay all your payments up and pay your lease out of time and turn it in, there's no penalty for that. They're getting a the vehicle earlier. It's actually good for the leasing company. If there's a difference between, though, if you want to go in and argue with them about my payoff, I'm not going to use the last 12 payments, you want a discount on the payments, that's something you'd have to negotiate in the lease, early lease termination. Some companies will give you a break. I can't speak for all of them, but I know some will, especially if you've leased with them before and there's got some circumstances, right? The gross capitalized cost of a leased vehicle is the negotiated price along with any other items that you're financing in. Tax on a down payment, for instance, if you had a down payment, dealer fee, all that stuff, that would be the gross capitalized cost. Inception fees, any fees that are due at the lease inception. You know, inception fees may include a down payment, security deposit, acquisition fee, like a dealer fee. First month's payment, payment taxes, title fees, those are inception fees. When I talk about sign and drive, what you're doing is including those inception fees in the lease. You can get a lease that does that. To reduce monthly payments, some lease deals are structured so that a combination of down payment and assorted fees can total several thousand dollars. So you could, you know, you might have to put it in there if you didn't have to several thousand. That's part of it. What it really boils down to when you're shopping a lease, you're not buying a vehicle, so it really boils down to how much the monthly payment is. I don't care what they put on the paper they sold it for, they bought it, I don't care. What's the payment? That's the one that counts. That's all I'm going to be paying is the payment. Now, at the end, the residual value is never going to change unless they build in more miles. You can't change the residual value on a vehicle. You can't say, okay, let's make a deal where the residual value is 14000 instead of fifteen. can't. All they can do is buy more mileage. You could lower the residual by buying more mileage. And that will, in fact, come off in the residual value because it's worth less at the end and then just not use the mileage. That would be the only thing I can think of to, to alter the residual value. Then you're going to have something on there about an indemnity. That's a lease contract provision that absorbs the lesser from charges incurred by the leasee. So, like, say you lease the vehicle and you get 100 parking tickets, and then you go to turn it in. The indemnity clause says they're not responsible, that you still are. Then there's one for those could described as lease fee, which is the same as implied interest. How much is the interest on the loan if you're buying it? How much is the lease fee if you're leasing it? The cost of actually leasing a vehicle, not the amount you're paying off on a vehicle. This is like interest. You can get some idea of the equivalent annual percentage rate if you multiply the lease fee money factor by 2,400. So if you got a fact, they say, well, that's a 3.0 factor. And they want to tell you the, the interest rate. Just multiply it times 2,400. It'll tell you the rate. Or if they're telling you the interest rate and don't tell you the factor, divide by 2,400. And that should be the factor. So if you're trying to figure out what they're selling the vehicle for, you can ask them what the interest rate is, and they have to tell you. Or they can say it's a factor. They have to tell you one of those numbers. You can figure out what the interest rate is. 
and work it in your payment calculator that you should be carrying with you and the residual, and that should tell you where the lease should be to see if they're packing you, trying to pack payments. We talked about that, right? If a dealer quotes you a money factor, such as 3.1, which sounds like a low APR, you might multiply by that 2,400 amount, 2,400, and get the equivalent APR. In this case, the rate would be 7%. So three, if they tell you the factor is 3.1, they're actually telling you that the interest rate is 7%. While lessors are not required to disclose the money factor, you still can insist on knowing it before entering a lease, you know, 100% of the time. You could do that. So you don't have to tell you the, re- the factor, but a lot of times you can, you can figure it out if they tell you what the price is and they tell you what the residual is and how long you know how long the term is, well, you can just back that into the price if you have a calculator. The leasee, the person who agrees to lease the vehicle, that's you, the consumer. The lessor is the name of the company that's leasing the vehicle. They're called the lessor. So there's the leasee, that's you, and the, the lessor, which is the company. Mileage allowance, that's something we haven't talked about. All residual values are based on a certain amount of driving mileage. The national average is 12,000 miles a year. So most leasing, you know, the advertised residual value percentage is based on 12,000 miles a year. If you drive less than that, sometimes they'll have incentivized leases for 39 months where you can only, you know, you'll think the payment's great, but what they're doing is they're going to limit your mileage to nine or 10,000 miles a year or 8,000 miles a year. And if you go over that, you'd have to pay 15 cents, 20 cents a mile for every mile you go over it. So they're kind of, I don't, I don't consider that very uh, honest. But if you buy mileage, I'll give you an example. So if you're allowed 12 and let's say you're going to drive 25, you'd have to buy 13,000 miles a year to, con- to, for a lease. And you're going to pay 10 to 15 cents a mile for it if you buy it in advance. It's still less if you buy it in advance. But that way you don't have to worry about any surprises at the end. You can build it in. Most of the leases I've leased in my life have been 15,000 mile a year leases, which I ended up, you know, paying for 3,000 miles up front. So I didn't have to worry. Sometimes I went over, I got to the 45. Sometimes I didn't. Sometimes it was money out to the window. But you know what? The peace of mind was worth it. But most of them are based on 12,000 miles a year. And you want to know that during your negotiation. I always talk about complete payment information on a lease. Part of the complete payment information is the mileage per year. Because they're working a lease with you and they lower the payment. You know, they could take out lower the mileage and that would lower the payment and not tell you until on delivery, we just, wait a second, nobody told us that. Well, that's how we lowered the payment. You think they lowered it with price. They didn't. They used the mileage to do it. Mileage charge, that's the charge I'm talking about. It exceeds if you go over it. You're going to be charged for the extra mileage that you go over on a, on a lease. It's usually 15 cents a mile. That would be the most common amount. So if you went over by 2,000 miles, what's that come to? 2,000 miles, 150 bucks? We're in there? Yeah, 150 bucks. Or 300 bucks. That would actually be 300 bucks. So, but that, you, you know about it up front if you're going over. And if you go over, you go over. You know, it's not like you didn't spend the money. It's not like you didn't go over. Not like you didn't get to use. So it's not like anybody's cheating anybody. But by getting a, going with a standard mileage, you take the chance of not going over. And that's Normally what I do now, I didn't used to, but now what I do is I just buy the regular mileage. And if I go over, I know that going in and I pay the, the amount. The purchase option is the opportunity for the leasee to buy the vehicle at the end of the lease. It'll give you the purchase option information in the contract, whether you can buy it or not, and what that number is. If they don't tell you, find out. That's the area where the rules have changed. You can buy it, but you can't sell it. And you have, you know, you can't trade it in another dealership. That actually changes the whole rights under the truth in lending. I don't know why our attorney generals haven't done anything about this yet. This is the most deceptive thing done by car dealers in a long time. This is just flat out crooked. Because the market went crazy and used vehicles were worth more, they stuck together. All the companies, Ford, Honda, Toyota, all did it in the same month. And said, look, you can't trade. And the reason why is because they want all those cars coming back to them because of the increased market. A game, of, you know, they, they could make a lot, thousands of dollars on those vehicles. And they're kind of forcing people to trade them back in. And of course, the government didn't do a doggone thing. Again, they didn't help the consumer. And much as you talk about it and talk to your blue in the face, they just don't do it. But you can buy it at the end. Like I bought mine at the end, paid for it. And I got the title, took about, what, a month? 
get the title. And once I got the title, I can do what I want with it. Now I can sell it. Now I can trade it. Now I can do whatever I want. But that's a pain in the neck. And I liked it the old way. And I think it'll go back to the old way if we, you know, it's important. A leased vehicle, though, is taxable if you decide to buy it. You're going to have to pay tax on the selling price, just like you were buying it used. Because it's not your vehicle, you're buying it used. So you're going to have to pay sales tax on it. But, you know, if you do it, you'll not be subject to a tax, of a, you know, on, on a trade tax. You don't own any of that. You just own the regular sales tax. Regulation M, the Federal Reserve Board's Consumer Leasing Act, which requires full disclosure of all leasing costs. Residual value, we talked about that one. We've talked about that a lot. That's probably the biggest factor in any resale issue about whether you buy cars, sell cars, or, you know, sell your cars or buy them, you know, lease them. I don't care how you get them. Residual value, the, the, which is another word for resale value, is the single most important factor in what costs you money. The higher the residual value or the resale value, the less it costs you to own that vehicle. And residuals are based on a fixed percentage of the original MSRP. That's where they get that number from. So give you an example. You know, the interest rate might be 50%. I mean, the residual rate, 50%. And what they're talking about, 50%, is 50% of the original MSRP. Take the MSRP right on the dealer's window. You take that bottom right-hand corner price. That price and multiply it times 50%. And that's residual for, I'm not, you know, it depend. Everyone's different, so that might be, it sounds like, about a three-year residual, maybe a little more. You ever, when you buy a vehicle, you're going to have a residual value. You're just not, it's just yours. It's not the leasing companies. It's still going to have resale. That's the thing that costs you the most. That's the thing you should be most concerned about with a vehicle when you buy one, is the residual value. That's huge. Security deposit, a lot of companies require a security deposit that's equal to one payment, so they're getting one extra payment to hold on. In case you get in trouble, got sick for a month, and they don't have to get stuck for the money. They could use that security deposit. A lot of companies don't ask for that anymore. No. I haven't been asked for a security deposit in forever. The lesser enjoys the interest on the amount throughout the term of the lease. In theory, you should get this deposit back at the end of the lease. But if you have excessive mileage, wear and tear, or something on the vehicle, that that Security deposit can be kept for those costs. Subvented or subsidized lease, that's a lease subsidized by the automaker. Usually it's a captive lease company to make the vehicle more attractive. In fact, that's the only real sales trick that, or not trick, but item that Mercedes-Benz uses. Sometimes they'll come out with, they never have rebates and stuff like that or discounts, but they might come out with an incentivized lease. And what they're doing is instead of, let's say, the lease being at three years, 60% or 58%, they move it up 2%. So instead of 58% of the MSRP, we'll make the residual 60% of the MSRP. And with a lower amount paid off and a higher residual, your monthly payment goes down. And that's why they do that. Sign and drive, that's the way you should shop every time. What you're saying in a sign and drive is, I'm going to pay the first payment. So if it's a 36-month lease, I'm going to pay the first payment when I pick it up and sign, and that's it. So everything else is in the lease. Now, when you compare with another dealer, dealer to dealer, sign and drive, hard to hide anything. It's all in there. You just compare monthly payments, and that's the end of that. And you've only got, when you drive out in that vehicle, you've got 35 payments left, or if it's a 36-month lease, and that's it. Now, if you're going to be, don't want to do sign and drive, don't, you want to have a down payment, keep in mind, you could still shop sign and drive and find out where you got the best deal. And then say, no, I've changed my mind. I want to put some money down. That won't have any effect on what their numbers are. They'll be glad to do that for you. But how you negotiate the best, the easiest way to compare and comparable to know what's going on is to go with a sign and drive. That makes it really easy to shop. Termination fee or disposal or disposition fee, amount leasing companies charge at the end of your lease if you're going to turn it in. So if you get done with your lease, in your contract, in advance, you were told, and if you read it down through the down through the numbers area on your contract, you'll get down to one that'll say usually about three fifty. If you decide to turn the vehicle in, we're going to charge you three hundred and fifty dollars lease turn-in fee. Now they started doing this. They didn't do it for a long time. They started doing this what maybe ten years ago, I guess ten or fifteen years ago, and it's just another way for them to make some money. 
and talk to people. If you buy it, you don't pay the inception, you know, the turn in fee. So if you buy it, that's out. But I think, you know, it's just a way to for them to hog out some other money. It's not an early termination fee. It's a termination fee right at the end. If you release, like when I was with Honda, two times in a row, I released a vehicle. They waived that termination fee because I turned in my vehicle and, and from them, with them and released a new Honda. I didn't pay that. That's up to them. They can waive whatever they want. But make sure it's, you know, stated clearly in the contract. Isn't agreeable. At termination, you're in no position to negotiate, and the lesser can apply your your security deposit towards the, this fee if they want. Many times, the lesser will have fee in there, and if everything goes well, definitely, if you you know release with them, they'll pass it up. They can even pass it up with some people if everything goes well. Like normally, I wouldn't get charged because I take my car back. It's low mileage. It's clean. It's not been used. I mean, it's I don't smoke. There's no smells in it, nothing. And normally they've waived it anyway, but they don't have to. You know? And as time goes on, as the business is tougher and it's a more, what would you call it, tough market, they're liable to do less of that. Yeah, they're going to charge those fees because they need the money. <laughs> Yeah, make sure it's stated clearly, though. All these things, the residual, you can buy it at the end. Make sure that's all in the contract. A bird in the hands worth two in the bush. Know it right up front. Wear and tear charges. Charges for damages to a leased car that are greater than normal or reasonable. Be sure there's a definition in the lease agreement. Most of them do. Most companies have a fee of like $2,000. you are going to have $2,000 in fees of things that it needs when you turn it in, and they won't charge you. So, you know, but they charge a ridiculous price for each item. So you can have a couple of dings. I think a dings under the size of the, your fingernail, I think, are not chargeable. You know, door jam marks, stuff like that. They don't normally charge it for... They're really trying to avoid somebody bringing a vehicle in with bald tires. They don't have to be full trap, but they can't be bald. Or they don't want you bringing in a vehicle that's got damage. You know, it's been in a wreck in a parking lot and, you don't want to pay for it. No, you're not going to get away with that. They're going to charge you. But there'll be a definition in the lease agreement. Read it. In fact, a lot of companies now have a fee they can charge you in your payment. I think it's $10 a month. Maybe it's more now. Where they'll waive up to $3,000 in repairs. Some companies don't charge anything for that. For years, Honda did. And Honda's always... I, I have to say that the best experience I've had leasing was with Honda every time. This this rule change in the middle of a lease with Toyota has kind of soured my me towards Toyota. I mean, I don't the fact they changed it in the middle of the road. I wouldn't I wouldn't go with them. I'm not saying I wouldn't buy another Toyota, but I wouldn't lease it from them. No, I'd have to go someplace else or something. But I can't allow people to get away with those things and then not do anything about it. It's really 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 dishonest for them to have brought it up. In the middle of the lease. It'd be different if it was, like I said, if you're leasing it right up front and they tell you, okay. But after you've left a year and a half later and then they change the rules on you, no, nah, that ain't right. The length of lease is called the term. That's another thing. They'll call it the term. You don't usually find that on a purchase. You know, they'll talk about how long you want to finance it for, but on a lease, they call it the lease term. Typical leases are 24, 36, or 48 months. Generally speaking, the shorter the lease is, the higher its monthly payment would be slightly. That's because depreciation and the residual value is higher in a shorter-term lease. But that's the way to go safe. That's why 36 months is the one I recommend. You know why? Another reason is there's no warranty work. It's completely under warranty for the first 36 months. Nothing. All they could charge you would be for the oil changes. There's so many things that happen. You don't have to worry about things going wrong. There's nothing that's going to be outside of warranty. All the latest, you know, technologies in there. And after three years, there's a lot of new technology which I want to get. I want to get a new vehicle. I like picking up a new vehicle. There's a lot of advantages to leasing. Three, three year lease. And sometimes the manufacturers will advertise long term leases, 48 and 60 months, to get the payment down. I don't recommend leasing those lengths of time, nope, because you're really upside down on a lease. At 60 months, you still have a residual value, so you're in trouble. A lot of times you'll see shorter terms at a 
sometimes, where they're going 36 months or 24 months. But they're doing that to shorten the term because if that's soon that you buy a vehicle, so they'd rather sell you four vehicles in 10 years than two, which makes sense, right, with short term. In fact, for a long time, Ford had a program that they used called Half a Car, and Half a Car promoted two-year leases and three-year leases because the advantage was that you'd end up getting another one. They made a lot of the incentives in that case. So you could have that happen where you see a short-term lease. But generally speaking, it's, you know, it's not going to be a bad or it's going to be about the same kind of rate, you know, relatively speaking. They're going to steer you that way because they can sell you a new vehicle sooner. I, I've said about 100 times on this podcast, never more than 36 months. Not 37, not 48, not 39. 36 months avoids all the considerations that can happen. That term maximizes all the advantages of leasing. 36 months is like a little bit of a, a really a optimum point. There's no, everything is under warranty for 36 months. Everything. Not damage if you get an accident, but that's, that's why I have insurance. But you're, there's, and not many things can go wrong. Think about it. When, when you, all of your friends that have cars have broken down and had a major repair, it wasn't in the first 36 months, usually. I mean, it could happen, but it's not. Normally, it's four or five years down the road. Well, at least you're never going to get any of that, and you're in a new, next thing you know, you're in a new vehicle again. There, there's some excitement to that, right? One last thought. Out the door is paramount when buying. It's not what really matters on the lease, though. If you're doing a sign and drive, no funds up front at all, with the exception of first payment on delivery, one of the 36 months assistant, then that's the only thing you have to worry about. I don't care if they sell the car to the leasing company for $2 million. If this is my monthly payment that I'm agreeing to, the one that we're talking about, and that's my end of my responsibility, I don't care what they do. It makes it very simple. If that's the case and the term and the residual is correct, you check the residual when you get the payment and the mileage, make sure the mileage is only on there, right? That's part of the complete payment, CPI. Who cares what those numbers are? You got to remember that. It doesn't make any difference. Just make sure that you're getting the right mileage. There's no money having to come up with. If their payments the less, at least that, that's it. So what you just heard today was the advantages and the terminology for leasing. That's leasing in a nutshell. I mean, it's a big nutshell, but it's still a nutshell. That's Deal Talk for this week. If you have any questions or requests or even a comment, please call, text, or email me. Callers or texters go to 407-801-4071. That's 407-801-4071. For email, it's dealtalk at mail.com. That's dealtalk at mail.com. Please don't forget to do a review and do yourself a favor by getting a copy of The Informed Buyer from Amazon or Nook. It's three bucks. Right? It's the best three bucks you'll ever spend. Who knows what it might make you remember? Who knows? There's no way it can hurt you. And if you want to be a hero, tell your friends and neighbors about Deal Talk. Everybody that listens, I've had a lot of people, a surprising number of people, thank me about the warnings on electric vehicles. They were planning on buying one, and then when they get the real skinny, that's the end of it. I've been listening to the scientists and this fellow named... Peter Zehan, Z-E-I-H-A-N, sharp cookie. He talks about a lot of things in the economy, but he's got it together in electric vehicles, too. They aren't going anywhere. You couldn't pick a worse choice. There's a lot of ways that fossil fuel really is better for us. And that's why in the 200 years they've been working on electric vehicles haven't developed, because it really doesn't make any sense. Fossil fuel makes sense. Isn't that funny? Call it, it's funny they call it fossil fuel. It doesn't come from fossils. I wonder if anybody knows that, but that's not where it comes from. Anyway, tell your friends, save them some money, and remember, every payment you get should be CPI, complete payment information. The amount, the months, the rate, any required down payment to get to those terms, and the mileage, if it's a lease, the yearly mileage allowance. Every time they quote your payment, you get that information. Every single time. Yep, not once in a while, every single time. And if you're buying a vehicle and doing your own financing, you want a payment that's all in. Every single cost required to take that vehicle out of the dealership. The tax, plates, dealer fee, any aftermarket options that are required, you have to buy, everything. 
everything in there. They call that OTD, out the door.